afternoon and welcome to the 16th Bitcoin Cash Developers Meeting of 2019. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all here. I'll start with introductions in my top left hand corner, uh, Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Cox, uh, software engineer working on Bitcoin ABC. I did that wrong. Um, other Jason. <laughs> uh, I'm Jason Dreisner, working on bidoff.com. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Anthony Ziegers. Hi, I'm Anthony, work on Bitcoin ABC and various other Bitcoin Cash projects. Thank you. And Matthias? Hello, everyone. I'm Matthias Garcia. I work on BitPay and I work mainly on the wallet and open source stack. Great, thank you, Matthias. Uh, Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Lundeberg. I work on um, Electron Cash, Bitcoin ABC, various other things. Okay. Uh, Omri, do you want to do a quick introduction? Yeah, I'm Omri. I'm, uh, I'm the lead dev of uh, Bitcoin ABC. Okay, thank you. And Josh Green? Hi, I'm Josh Green. I am the lead developer for uh, Bitcoin Verde. Thank you. Uh, Tyler Smith. Hi, I'm Tyler Smith. Uh, I do various Bitcoin Cash projects. Uh, lately, I've been working with BCHD and working on Avalanche. Great. Thank you, Tyler. And Chris. I'm Chris Pacia, the uh, lead developer for BCHD. Great. Thank you. With the introductions out of the way, we have a fairly full agenda today, and I'll just go through quickly what's going to happen. Um, uh, the first item on the agenda will be discussion of Avalanche. Second will be discussion of the upgrade preparedness. Uh, and then the third is creating a BCHT specification. Uh, and this is related to BUIP 121. Um, and then following that, we'll discuss the upgrade potential items. There are four items potentially on the table for that. And then uh, we'll uh, expect questions and, uh, from the audience and any other information that people want to bring forward for this meeting. So uh, without any further ado, I guess we'll jump into Avalanche. This is left over from the last meeting when we ran out of time. So Tyler, would you like to start off with that, please? Sure. So uh, where I'm at is my prototype is nearing being feature complete for the first milestone release. Uh, I've just got a, a few little utilities to write to make the UX a little nicer um, for, the, for the feature completeness. Most of my work over the past month has been working on um, the test net and collecting data uh, and doing simulations uh, across a wide number of nodes. So I've built a system that lets me scale up um, nodes up and down so that I don't have to have a bunch running all the time, but can still do tests with many dozens of nodes uh, that are geo distributed. Um, that's been running for the past two or three weeks without any hiccups simultaneously um, doing finalizations for all of the transactions and blocks in that time. Uh, and there's a, a sub second uh, average finality latency for all of those, meaning um, on average, it's taken about 0.4 seconds to come to a decision um, on each transaction and block which is pretty good. There's still some optimization to do there. It's certainly not perfect. Um, and obviously that will change some as the, the network scales up and down, but I think that's a pretty good start. Um, so kind of where I'm at now is just doing a lot of code cleanup uh, and writing a lot of automated testing uh, just to make sure everything is solid. Uh, and then I'm trying to finish up the paper, trying to, um, collate all of the data that I've been collecting and try to formalize uh, my decisions. Uh, I've reached out to uh, Emin and some of the other people at Ava Labs to um, work with them on formalizing some of the security parameters that I've chosen um, that, that are in the Avalanche paper and need to be picked so that uh, in my paper I can have a good analysis of um, what parameters were chosen and, and why and all that stuff. So um, 
all in all, the, the first milestone prototype is coming along pretty well. And I, I'm hesitant to, you know, promise any sort of release date or anything, but uh, I'm optimistic that I can get something public uh, sometime before the end of the year. So that's kind of where I'm at with that right now. That's great. Um, could we have uh, any questions for Tyler, please? Uh, I don't have any specific question, but I would recommend that you share as much as possible what you have, even if informally, because I know, um, you know, I know the feeling maybe you're going to like work on that and get like everything like super nice and shiny. And, and at the last minute, someone, you know, discovered that something could have been better with some other parameter or whatever, and everything needs to be uh, changed in a way that ended up being very expensive and everybody gets frustrated. And, um, you know, it's just an unpleasant process for everybody. So in order to avoid that, I think the, the best is to share as much as possible, even if it's like, you know, unfinished stuff, in which case you can, you know, present them as such, not as, you know, next big thing. But, you know, here is what I was thinking about doing. And I think it's best because X, Y, Z, this kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's definitely, you know, um, not going to be over polished. I don't think anybody's going to think I, I put too much time into to polishing it or anything. Um, I mostly just want to uh, have a have a, the best first impression possible. But uh, I hear what you're saying. I, I definitely uh, don't expect to not have to make a lot of changes based on review. And this is just the, the very beginning of a long review and feedback cycle. So, um, but yeah, I heard you. I'll try to uh, get some stuff public to some of you guys for uh, review sooner than later. Great, thanks, Tyler. Uh, any other questions for Tyler? Yeah, I kind of just was curious about some of the technical details. Like, I know there's been discussion about, like you're talking about the vertices, I think they're called, which is basically like the DAG and how you how you like what you're deciding on within the protocol? I was curious how that act like actually works. So, so are you doing that? Like, like it's deciding on a DAG of transactions, not just um, individually. And then, how is that done? Like, is there some kind of data structure for that, or what's going on in there? Sure. So there is still some work to do to sort of uh, fully utilize Avalanche. Um, so, so as you were saying, the, the vertexes are transactions and blocks, and they're connected together by uh, the, the flow of transaction outputs. So uh, a transaction that spins the outputs from another transaction is linked um, by that expenditure. Uh, and then similarly, blocks are, they have edges to all of the transactions that are included in that block. So. Um, the idea is that like, if you finalize a block, then that finalization kind of flows through the graph transitively to all of the, the transactions and other blocks that that one block touches. Um, so I, I am modeling uh, the transactions and blocks as a graph uh, data structure in memory. And um, I, I'm slowly working on totally utilizing Avalanche, but for now it is still finalizing every single um, vertex. It's not utilizing oh. the fact that it can know that, you know, th this one was finalized by another vertex upstream in the graph. Um, I, I need to do some more work to be able to efficiently calculate uh, those paths in the graph to be able to oh, decide okay. that, right. if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that makes sense. yeah, so it'll get there, but right now it's, um, it's still doing what I've been calling disjointed snowball, which is just uh, using a snowball for every single item uh, instead of fully embracing the graph. But um, that's certainly the plan to get there, but this method is a lot less work up front. So kind of in the vein of what Omri was saying, I don't wanna go down the path into finding the optimal way to do all these graph traversals um, until some of the other fundamentals get vetted a little better. 
Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I just, yeah, I, got, I guess I got the impression that there was more of the graph traversal stuff happening, but that, that, I think what you're doing makes sense. That's, yeah, there's, a, there's a little bit, um, and I've experimented with, with different ways to do it and different ways to form the edges and stuff, but uh, I think for now we're just going to start off pretty simple with the way that I described and then iterate. It's basically like Snowball or whatever it's called on pretty much all the transactions. And then, and then the blocks, like when you finalize a block, then that would kind of subsume all the transactions. Yeah, yeah. It. So there is kind of a a mixture where right now if a if a block gets finalized it does go through and marks all of its all of the transactions and that block is finalized but it doesn't like recursively go back to all transactions that that might be unfinalized that could be finalized if that makes sense so it kind of just i guess i guess you could say it's kind of like avalanche but the uh the flow of the the finalizations through the graph only goes one level deep right now. That okay. So that makes me thinking um, if you like, I'm not sure we want to be querying, allowing querying like all the transaction forever in the past anyway, right? Because you would have to keep a No, you just need to do the latest block like when yeah. you start up. So I don't yeah, think so it's that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, it's set up so that uh, when you start, it just does snowball for the latest block and then does them on transactions as they come in. And then as we iterate, we'll make it smarter so that it doesn't have to do all transactions that come in. Um, so, yeah, it, it won't do every transaction and you know when it's done. Anything further for Tyler on Avalanche? We'll move on to I, the next, oops, sorry. sorry. It, it took me a second to unmute myself. Um, how does it communicate? Is it through just like the P2P like protocol or is it like a whole other socket level? Yeah, so currently it is. Um, ultimately, I think we want to have a quick protocol that they can use to connect to each other. But after talking um, to Omri and some other people, it sounds like there's some some underlying work that needs to be done there first before we can use it. So I did start down that road a little bit trying to integrate quick, but decided um, there's just other ways to, to make progress right now while we're waiting for the quick changes to shake out. So that, that will be in place, but for now it's just piggybacking off the uh, P2P network. So I, I can expand a bit more on that. Um, so, it, it can move forward without quick and I suggest we do that. It's just going to be faster. But the way I think the way we want to deploy that in production is by using quick. And the reason is right now, all the message, at least all the important messages that we transmit through the peer-to-peer -peer layer, they are either signed already, like transaction, they are signed. So you cannot like, you know, make stupid bullshit transaction that don't correspond to anything and blocks are expensive to produce. And this is very easy to check, right? And so uh, that makes it very difficult to manipulate the network in any way with bogus messages because you can either not sign them or either you need to spend a very large amount of resources to produce them to begin with. Um, this is not the case for Avalanche, right? So that leaves us with two options if we want to do that in a way that is actually secure. And one of them is to sign every single avalanche messages. But um, this ends up creating a huge amount of signature that you need to generate and then that you need to verify. Uh, and, and that can be pretty expensive. Uh, especially like if you imagine that um, you're going to finalize in like one second or so for every second worth of transaction you're going to do, you know, like many round trip of avalanches, right? So you're going to end up verifying many more signature due to avalanche than to validate the transaction themselves, uh, which is going to end up being pretty expensive in terms of CPU. So that's, that's a solution, but that's not the ideal solution. Uh, so the ideal solution would be to use an encrypted tunnel, right? So you have both party that, you know, generate some key via some protocol, uh, you know, some DFL man-based protocol, 
and then use that key to encrypt the whole channel and that way a third party cannot manipulate any of the avalanche messages or produce fake avalanche messages and have you believe that you know they are they are correct and this way you end up um this way you end up having like a secure tunnel for both party to communicate without having to sign every single messages so that's that's much preferable and there are you know a whole lot of advantages uh, to use quick that don't depend on avalanche but you know for in the case of avalanche specifically this would this would be the feature we're interested in and so i think that the rollout in production needs to happen uh, based on quick and we should not use avalanche on you know that doesn't mean we need to disable the whole tcp connection that we use right now there are going to be at least a transition period and maybe forever or nodes that accept both but you don't want to be doing avalanche on the um, you know on the non quick channel okay we're all good on avalanche no final comments i guess i have one question i was just kind of curious what the network topology was for your tests tyler So uh, I have, I'm working out of six different regions in AWS. Um, and when I spin it up, I put at least two nodes in each region, like when I have a, a full test going. Um, but I've gone up to five nodes per region um, before. But yeah, it's just, uh, I think uh, one in North America, two in Europe, one in Australia, and one in Singapore, um, roughly, are where the nodes are located. So do you, do you fully connect them, or do you build a more complicated topology than that? Uh, each, each node connects to, um, I have it set up to connect to about 75% of the other nodes, if that's what you mean, yeah. So they're not, okay. all, they're not all tightly connected, but um, they're connected to most other nodes. Got it, thanks. And last call, any final comments on Avalanche? All right, thank you very much, Tyler. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is a discussion of the upgrade preparedness. Uh, network, the network upgrade is in just over a week. How does the status look for software and services on the network? Um, who would like to start off on that one? Um, I'm happy to. Uh, so uh, Bitcoin Verde is, uh, we've written all of the code for uh, the hard fork. Uh, we still have some, uh, basically with, uh, with the code that we, uh, or with the, sorry, the, uh, the spec, there was also some additional test vectors. Um, a lot of them get into uh, like the strict encoding flags, um, which is awesome uh, because determining that, you know, we're in, consensus with everybody else um, from like a network level uh, is uh, we also as just a consensus level too it was pretty difficult so we've been working on getting the test vectors um, uh, up to date and then when that happens we're going to publish our final release so um, we should be on time for like making it maybe a couple of days before the actual hard fork um, our schedule is pretty lax because there's not too many Bitcoin Verde nodes on the network so we don't really hear a whole lot of demand for getting uh, everything out as fast as possible. So, uh, but as far as the actual spec, it's, it's, it's all pretty good. I think Mark did a fantastic job actually um, with the, uh, the multi-sig spec. And in fact, uh, that I'll bring that up later for the, uh, the official spec stuff, but it's, it was probably one of the cleanest ones I've seen so far. So. Thanks, Josh. Any questions for Josh regarding Bitcoin Verde? No, very succinct. Uh, um, any other uh, upgrade preparedness information from um, maybe BCHD? Yeah, so I mean, we have our release out that <clears throat> that has the the upgrade code in it. Seems to be um, <clears throat> working well. Um, there is one exception is that our our current release contains some migration code to the database that um, unfortunately um, 
breaks the any nodes of ours that use the fast sync option previously. Um, so we have an we're working on another release. We have code to to fix that. Basically, disable the migration in the fast sync case. Um, but I mean, if someone wanted to use the current released version, the fast sync only really takes like a half hour to to just resync anyway. Um, there's that, and so that 15.1 will probably release that fairly shortly. The only other thing we're trying to get in there is we've seen with some of these reorgs happen on testnet, um, the reorgs have caused uh, like a couple of our nodes to crash. Um, with the, it's a, a weird panic where it's um, it's a unlock of an of an unlock mutex, and the, unfortunately, the the stack trace really doesn't give any any indication of what mutex is is the offending one. So we're trying to put in some extra logging. Tyler has written some code for it for some extra logging around mutexes, so we can build like we can create a custom build that has this extra logging in it. So if it happens, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a better idea. Other than that, we just need to try and find a way to better test this reorg stuff. Um, I mean, our, our actual reorg unit test pass, but just something that happens on the live network causes it. But uh, that's, that's the state of where we are. All right. Any questions for Chris on BCHD's preparedness? All right. Um, anything to report on your preparedness, ABC folks? We're ready. Okay. Well, we, I mean, Mark will might want to talk about this more, but we did some more testing on the upgrade test net and did another activation test. And Mark made a whole bunch of more transactions. So, so maybe I could ask Mark to describe more. Like we, we've just been doing more testing and, and, and it's all going pretty well. Or very well. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 hard to do really great tests um, using a test net because a lot of the test vectors you want to do are negative ones where it's like your node should reject this one. So I can't like broadcast that transaction and then because my node won't take that transaction, you know. Uh, so ideally, people should be using test vectors, uh, relying primarily on that. But yeah, the activation went smoothly and everything's fine. Um, and just just a note, by the way, I, I was looking on the cash.coin.dance nodes page, so uh, a little oh, breaking up, Mark. A while ago, I looked on there, and there were very few nodes that were like up action. So it seems to have jumped a lot. Sixty-eight percent right now. I guess the rest just don't care. Still, some people out there running like uh, ABC zero point seventeen. So whatever, they don't care. Uh, everyone heard Mark correctly? Yeah, okay, good. All right, uh, any further upgrade readiness um, or preparedness comments before we move on? I guess None? since sick pig's not here, I can also comment, like, because BU is part of that upgrade test net thing, so, so they've also been participating in the testing. It seems to be going okay so far. Yeah, Andrea Susani unfortunately was unable to make it. Um, so uh, sick pig, I mean. All right, thank you for that, Anthony. Uh, moving on to the next item, then we are going to discuss uh, creating of a BCH specification. Uh, this is according to BUIP one twenty one, and Josh Green is here to talk about that. Uh, so uh, yep, so BU uh, put out that uh, BUIP. Um, I feel like when we were in Australia or somewhere near there. Um, and its premise is basically just to take the spec and, uh, or to, to take what we currently have as a spec and make it uh, a bit more formal and much more complete. Um, so we are happy to actually like kind of uh, take ownership of that uh, ask, uh, we being uh, my company, Software Verde. So uh, we reached out to uh, the BU team and, and asked if you know, they'd be willing to uh, sponsor our development. There was some sponsorship available uh, when they released that BUIP and, and uh, they said that that seems like it'd be a good fit. So um, 
uh, a few people uh, and the software AI team, so like Mark, uh, Emergent Region Reasons, uh, Josh Althorpe, um, I think probably missing a couple of others, are all really interested in, in basically combing through uh, what the software does across all of the different implementations and really documenting that in a consolidated place so that when someone's writing, uh, not necessarily a brand new full node, but if they're writing, uh, I mean, although we would like to cover that as well, but um, if they're writing like a, a script, uh, a custom script for a Bitcoin cash transaction, having a single place to look and say, okay, well, what does this, like, what does the transaction need to actually abide by? What special cases, what, you know, what does strict encoding actually do? And how does that really impact, um, you know, the properties in my, in my non-trivial script? Um, so uh, for the month of December, we're going to be taking that as basically a full excuse me, a full-time job um, for uh, the month of December. So we're going to have uh, three people working on that. And uh, so we're going to, uh, I think it's still in discussion for how we're going to, like what the medium is going to be, but ultimately we're going to have a website. And uh, this website is going to be um, most likely a, um, uh, visualizations of uh, markdown files. So we're trying to keep things as accessible and forkable as possible. So that way we're not like, creating this uh, oligarchy that uh, you know, just repeats some of the same problems that we've had in the past. We want to make sure that if people disagree with the direction that this has gone, they can take, uh, take our contributions and, and you know, uh, do what they want with them. Um, so with that, we were working with um, uh, the BU team and actually using kind of like a custom tool that takes markdown files and makes them a bit more consumable and a bit more editable. Um, so that's, that's the intent. Um, we're not going to be done by the end of the month of December, obviously. It's just a tremendous undertaking to actually take this uh, specification and, and really upgrade it. Um, and uh, we feel like it's going to be a continual effort. Um, and we also aren't planning on making this a node-specific um, specification either. Um, obviously, we're going to call out the different behaviors of, of each node, but we're really trying to set up a framework so that, um, you know, uh, ABC can come in and say, okay, well, you know, if we, this is how we handle standard disk for this section. It's a little bit different. And having, uh, allowing them to voice what's different from their implementation. Same thing with Bitcoin Verde, saying this, these are the things that we do differently. Um, and then leaving that as kind of like the onus is on the different nodes to update the specification if they choose to. Um, meanwhile, having the consensus layer and, and generally accepted rules be um, uh, what's documented. So um, I don't know if you guys have any questions, uh, but I'm happy to, to field them. Any questions for Josh? Yeah, I want to clarify uh, your goal by the end of December. It sounds like you're mostly focusing on transaction format. Is that accurate? Uh, no, that's not necessarily uh, the intent. So, so the, the, the format of how we're going to have things laid out is actually uh, kind of, uh, I think it's going to lend itself well but it, uh, to, to what we're really trying to do. So we're trying to do like basically like block consensus uh, as a section and then doing like network consensus as a section. And then, you know, network consensus is obviously going to include like the P2P protocol and all the messages that get sent. Um, and we're really trying to do that in a method that is um, uh, like top, like the most generic thing first. So we're really actually just going to stub out um, like what I would call the top layer to like the medium layer and create a structure. And then that will allow us to kind of have some parallelism for actually writing the content. Um, and in having that structure out first, I think is going to be a really nice sandy check for, hey, does this does this feel like it's organized well? Because um, obviously there's going to be a different, like there's a thousand different ways that we can organize this. Um, and uh, then having each section, you know, having uh, its own kind of like subsection for differences between each, each implementation. Um, as far as what the goal is for month of December, um, it's really hard for us to um, know for certain how far we're going to get. Um, obviously like, three people working essentially full time is a lot of man hours. Um, but we don't really like a lot of that's going to be this, like the reverse engineering that we had to do just to like write Bitcoin Verde. 
Um, and that we're going to not only have to reverse engineer it for how we want to implement it, but then also reverse engineer it for um, all of time. So basically being like, this is, this is how it originally worked. And now like this patch happened on this date and now it behaves differently. And, and like Mark has done, like for example, I, was, I thought I'd mention that, uh, or I, I said that I was going to uh, bring up that, that spec, but if you ever looked at the, I'm probably sure a lot of you have, the actual specification that was just released by Mark for um, the Schnorr multisig, in the notes section, he calls out like, this is the state of all of the oddities that can exist. And he talks about like how public keys don't actually get validated unless they're about to be used, um, which you know is never really clearly stated anywhere. Uh, you just have to kind of like discern that from the various bits that have been uh, through the evolution of the protocol. So like aggregating that knowledge and then succinctly typing that out is a ton of work. Um, obviously, it's doable. Mark has basically proven that it's doable, um, and that's kind of our. That's kind of like the goalpost that we want for the entire protocol is saying, this is how things are. Um, if you care about, you know, if, if you're just trying to write something complicated, you want to know what the network is, how the network is going to behave. So having a place to do that is ultimately the final goal, but I think that's going to have to be an incremental process. Um, so for the, to your question, what's going to be happening at the end of December? Um, I mean, as much as we can, obviously the structure is going to probably take like a week. Um, of us just kind of figuring out and iterating through it. And then after that, we're going to start writing the content. Um, it's really up to the community and I guess the individuals to start picking areas that make the most sense for what gets done first. Um, and a lot of that's going to be expertise and um, you know, uh, interest, I suppose. So um, if you guys have preferences, let me know. Yeah. I just was wondering, well, first of all, I just wanted to say, yeah, I think this is really like it's great. Like having a specification documented and written down would be really awesome. So I think this is really a positive thing. Like, so I, I'm supportive of of, of this idea. <laughs> and I was, I guess, my question is like, if people want to get involved or or even just monitor what's going on, um, how 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 would they do that? Yeah, uh, that's what, a great question. And uh, so one of the other implement, like one of the other ways or other mediums that we were planning on kind of writing this was just a Wikimedia. Um, I think it's still up for debate, but I think we're like BU has requested that we don't use Wikimedia. So I think that's a pretty strong, um, uh, you know, like we're, we're taking that very seriously. Um, so um, we're really leaning towards the, the MD concept. Um, and obviously these MDs have to live somewhere. Um, and we don't, one of our, one of our concerns with the Wikimedia and, uh, Markdown kind of like debate, uh, was one of the properties that we need is we need to be able to prevent, um, basically people coming in and graffitiing the spec, right? Um, just because of who we are, who we are. So there's going to be a lot of people who uh, have incentive to, um, basically write false or wrong information. Um, and we also don't necessarily want one, uh, like node implementation to come in and say, this is the way things are and stomping on other people. Um, so uh, the right access for the like implementation that we'll be hosting is going to be a little bit oligarchically like set up. So like a representative from ABC can, you know, make changes to their, uh, to this, you know, Git repo, uh, which contains the MD files. Uh, same thing with BU, same thing with Bitcoin Verde, Flowey, et cetera. So everybody should have like representation here. Um, and what they're ultimately doing is making Git pull requests to the repo that displays the, the current status. Um, obviously, if someone disagrees with that, or, or, oh, go ahead. Like, is there a work group or something that people can join in? Or, yeah. Uh, or is this um, yeah, the, a lot of the coordination is happening in the, uh, the Bitcoin Verde Telegram group. Uh, we posted a link to that last time. I'm happy to do that again. Um, and uh, that's just kind of where a lot of the updates and discussions have been happening. Um, and then to view the incremental progress in December, we're going to just post the, the, um, the, the repo. Um, so people can check out the repo and, and, and uh, view things that way. Another thing, well, like, I guess I have a bunch of thoughts. This is really good, though, but... Uh, there was an effort previously to do a specification, and I think Enchain did a lot of work on that. I'm not, 
I'm not completely up to speed on exactly what was done, but are you aware of that? And I think there's maybe some of that could be like reused or leveraged because I yeah, think they um, really work. Yeah, the uh, I think uh, so. I'm not exactly. I've never looked at their the work that they've done. Um, so uh, that's the, the preface it with that. Um, there's also a ton of just work out there in general that we don't want to necessarily reinvent, uh, like the wheel. We don't necessarily want to start from scratch for the sake of starting from scratch is what I mean to say. So like, um, instead of the end chain documentation, obviously, uh, something that has been brought up was the, the Bitcoin.it, um, like wiki that exists. Yeah. Um, yeah. and there's a lot of content there and a lot of that's good, but a lot of it's also not applicable and a lot of it's just really old. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so what we can't do is we can't just copy in these documents and say, okay, well, this is the work that's been done. It's probably good. Um, but we can use it for like, oh, this section has a really good uh, description for how this is done. So let's use that and reincorporate that. Um, so what I predict going forward um, is if there is, if the work done by Enchain is available, I would love to have access to that and give the team access to that. So that way we can use as much of it uh, as we can going forward to just reduce the redundancy so we can be more effective for things. Cool. Yeah, I mean, we have, like, we've been trying to get good specifications up on bitcoincash.org, so it would be nice to try to, like, coordinate that and with the specs we already have and try to, like, improve improve that repo. I don't know if, like, what the goal is, if you want to, if it's intended to go there it seems like it would be a good idea yeah um i mean that would i think the way that it's set up is uh it leaves a lot of freedom for those kinds of decisions so if bitcoincash.org like if that repo wanted to take some of the stuff that we've written and uh post it themselves or even merge it into um their existing stuff i think that would be great um one of the things that also got brought up is we don't necessarily want the spec to be like go to this link um, because the links die and we want to take kind of like the stack overflow method where it's just like, for instance, if we were to link uh, a bit um, saying, hey, you know, historically, these are the changes that made on, that were made on this date. We don't want to link to bitcoincash.org uh, and say, go look at this bit. We actually want to include the document in the repo and then basically mm -hmm. hard link it. Okay, cool. Well, sounds good. <laughs> good luck. Thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah. Amri, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I have a few, a few common questions. Um, so first, I think it's, it's a great effort uh, to write a spec for BCH, and that's very much needed. And that's something that has been on the table like forever. Um, and there have been various efforts to try to make it happen. And, and, but none of them, like some of them ended up producing a, f a few stuff, but none of them ended up like pushing it through the finish line. Um, and so, um, what I, like, you know, what I'm, what I'm wondering is like, oh, oh, can we make sure that this one goes through the finish line? And, right. and so, so th there are a few, and I'm, I'm not quite sure to put that, but there are a few things that I'm seeing already that are uh, reproduction of old patterns. Uh, and, and because those old patterns did not work, uh, I'm, I'm a bit worried that this may reproduce. And so I would like to avoid this as much as possible. Um, so, so one of the things I've seen um, is, um, uh, it seems that this project want to restart from scratch the spec effort. And um, I'm wondering why, why go in that direction? Because um, there have been a few stuff already, but it seems to me that, that you know, pushing forward what has been already done, even though uh, the way it was done is not ideal because it was done you know, in the term of, of, of uh, patches over the existing, but the existing was not documented, so it's not it's not the best that it is. But I think it it would be very good to actually uh, uh, restructure that content quite a bit and and add the missing parts. Uh, it, it seems to me that it it would have a higher chance of success if it was to to go that way. 
Yeah, no, I think that's an awesome call out. I mean, it is. And, and I think also just calling out the fact that this has been done before is, is important. And uh, just as a reminder for everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, that there's, I think there's an XKCD or something like that about, you know, like people writing standards and then it's just one more standard that people ignore. Yeah, it's like, um, oh no, it's like 13 incompatible standards. Yeah. Like, so we can <laughs> to, like, unite them all. And then like, yeah, now we have 14 incompatible standards. Exactly. So uh, I think, I mean, that's always a risk. Um, and there's nothing to say that this one's going to be the de facto like final version. I think the thing that's going to make this, as you kind of put it, like, reaching the final, like the, the, what was it, the finish line, is going to be uh, just the community embracing the, the, the concept of it and actually putting in the effort. So I think if it reaches a critical mass and is um, a uh, collective effort and not just, um, you know, like for instance, if this was just Software Verde doing this, um, I think that would be pretty bleak. I think that would be bleak for a bunch of reasons, but, but also just like, you know, uh, it's just another person working in the corner uh, trying to, you know, document things. Um, so the fact that I think we have kind of basically at least one representative from every implementation is really positive. Um, so I think that's a positive sign. Um, and then ultimately, too, to clarify, I don't necessarily foresee us starting from scratch about everything. I think a lot of the documentation that's out there that hasn't changed is pretty solid. The thing that I want to start over from scratch with is the structure. Um, I want to uh, basically create the stubs for how things will um, uh, be organized with a fresh mindset um, and then uh, taking content that exists on an individual kind of like basis and incorporate it into um, the actual documentation for like, you know, the, the leaf node things um, like trend, like the transaction format, right? Um, that's been pretty well documented by a lot of people. Um, so I don't necessarily see why we would have to go like at the code and figuring out like, you know, literally what that looks like. I think we all pretty much kind of know what that looks like and that's been documented. So I don't necessarily see that being done from scratch or like, I don't think that's not, I don't think that's necessary to do from scratch. Um, so, but other things might be just because they haven't been, you know, touched in a while. And I think a lot of that's going to be done. Um, uh, I think that's going to be a judgment call by the person that's actually writing that particular page. Um, and that may be me, that may be Josh, um, that may be Andrew, like it, it could be, it could be anybody. I think it's going to be a judgment call and then making sure that we have those resources available that already exist um, is going to really help make, uh, it's going to enable them to like make an informed decision. So uh, I don't know if that answers your concern at all. Uh, Amari, uh, well, I think we can make it a little bit more clear because I, I have a question that expands on what Amari was saying. Because getting across the finish line is one thing, but then there's a the maintenance cost. And uh, there's actually also a coordination cost considering that there's multiple implementations and all this. So I'm wondering like primarily who's going to be taking on that mantle and making sure that the spec stays up to date. Cause that, that in and of itself is going to be quite a lot of work. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, it's actually been discussed a little bit in the Bitcoin Verde telegram. Um, I think emergent reasons was the first person to bring that up. And I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a really appropriate concern. Um, our, our, uh, thought process along that, obviously we can't predict the future, but our thought process along that is, um, from our standpoint, and by ours, I mean like Software Verde and Bitcoin Verde's perspective, um, if we get, if this ends up being a, uh, you know, if this goes in a direction that we foresee it going, um, we kind of see this as a place to basically use for our own, like, um, documentation as well. Um, like Bitcoin Verde saying, like, remember how I was talking about, like, each node has the opportunity to call out how, what they do differently? Um, that's a really good place for us to be incentivized to keep updating. Like this is like the new fork, like a new hard fork came around and we're like, okay, these are the changes that happen in the Bitcoin Verde section. Um, it, it, it makes sense to say, okay, well, this is, you know, we abide by blah, blah, blah. Um, but then also taking that hard fork or taking that, uh, actual spec and then updating as it goes, just because it helps us digest, um, what we need to be writing anyway. So I'm hoping that this becomes a valuable resource, which really incentivizes people to uh, continue to contribute. Um, that being said too, um, Software Writer is also a business. And the reason why we're doing this for the month of December is because it's funded. 
Um, BU, BU has expressed interest in uh, having follow-up funding for not just um, uh, the first like month or whatever, but also just incremental funding. So if there is funding that wants to be put available, like we are, you know, we're a software development company. <laughs> like if someone pays us to do it, we will do it. Um, so that I think is also a nice mitigating factor. Um, it's a little bit dependent on uh, BU continuing to sponsor the development, obviously. Um, but uh, it's at least something. And then we've also been exploring other people who have been interested in funding the, the effort as well, um, which could lead to uh, you know, just a real incentive to keep this document up to date. Um, and ultimately, again, I'm really hoping that this becomes valuable for the whole community so that people like uh, BU and ABC and Flowey, ECHD all actually say, okay, well, I want to update this because it is important because I use this all the time. Um, so that is the intent. Um, whether or not that happens, you know, I, I don't know the future. So I think it's going to be up to the community to decide whether or not this is a successful attempt or not. So let me try to rephrase my concern, maybe in a way that is uh, more actionable. Um, there is there is an ex, there is an existing spec repository and it's it open for you know everybody to contribute but uh, practically speaking i think the only people that have contributed to any significant extent are uh, mark that is present here and anthony uh, myself and a few people from um uh, what's the name of the company cyber capital right uh, but even though it's open for everybody to contribute, uh, other party never really seemed to be very interested in, in uh, actually like, you know, pushing that effort and make it a success. And so I'm really wondering, you know, like what is, what is different in that effort? Um, yeah, yeah. What is the, what is different in that effort so that the pattern doesn't reproduce? Um, yeah, this the spec repository. I would say it it discourages uh, participation a little bit because you have to submit a pull request and it has to be approved. Um, like but, if 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 well, you have to do that again, then then that's useless. I think like you you want something like a wiki where okay maybe somebody has to make an account so that they don't they prove that they're not going to graffiti the site they get authorized at the beginning but then. They can make edits and the edits appear right away and they can, you know, iterate rapidly, right? The wiki style. <laughs> well, but yeah, the the like... that, that they wanted to go the road using MD5, which is exactly what the existing spec repo does. And so you're going to have to make pull requests and, and get them approved the same way. Yeah, the, the, um, so that's what it's backed by, is what I really mean to say. So the, 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 um, the actual like, content is written as an MD, right? Um, the website isn't just GitHub. You know, it's not just us displaying the MDs. Um, BU has kind of like a wiki-like tool where it, it you know, isn't as polished as wiki, but it allows you to go in and make changes through the website and then basically that creates the request that says, okay, I would like to update this. Um, it may not, now, I, I don't know if, I don't know if it's necessarily like live live, like you hit the button and then it actually like merges it into the remote repo. I'm pretty like, that's going to be up to like what it BU should has be. Written. Uh, um, but, but yeah. I think if there's, um, any, if there's any delay, yeah. Why, why isn't it possible to do that on the existing spec? Yeah, on, on GitHub, you can click edit and it's, it creates a pull request, right? Why is it the same to do that on the existing spec? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that is a really good call out and actually saying like this, this tool is basically already existing um, uh, with GitHub is, is a pretty powerful statement. Um, the wiki was originally, and obviously Mark, you know, uh, a, lot, a bit about this because you were, I think, from the, you were there since the inception of this project. Um, I think Wikipedia really, or Wikimedia really fits what we were trying to go for. Um, and I think if we come back and actually have a conversation with, uh, you know, uh, 
BU and say, this is why we think the uh, Wikimedia would be better, um, then I think we can still have that conversation. It's still really early in the, uh, in, uh, in, in the project. Like we haven't even started things because we're not going to start things until December. Um, so I think if we really kind of articulate what, what our concerns are um, and make sure that those are still solvable, then uh, we can make a recommendation to go either route. Um, the, the, what's different between this implementation and uh, an existing one? Honestly, I don't think I have too much of an answer for you other than, uh, other than perhaps either marketing or like, and just like the community effort involved. Um, I don't really have anything uh, um, to say. Like, I think if you, I think if the argument is maybe we take the, um, the, the sponsorship money and take the existing spec, like the, ex the existing repo that has the spec and then start making updates to that, I think that's very valid, but I also think it's mostly the same except for the structure component. Um, I think if we restructure things, that's really the only kind of personal goal that I think I might have. Um, but other than that, like we, like things that are already complete, we want to use as a resource to ingest it. We don't necessarily want to rewrite granular things from scratch. Um, so I don't know if that uh, puts us in a unique spot. I think it kind of doesn't. Um, but I think the, from my perspective, we've seen so many people say, this is a great idea, let's keep doing it. Um, I think we really just need to capitalize on the fact that people legitimately see this as valuable and keeping people engaged and excited so that it actually just doesn't fizzle out like, uh, um, like the other projects do. That's really kind of the only recommendation I have. So, so I, have, I have a recommendation. Um, you should really try to talk to Quarantine and, um, and Corbin, who have been the two biggest contributor to BitcoinCash.org. They are effectively maintaining the sites. Um, I think it would be good to loop them in. I, I mean, I don't want to talk for them, but I think they would be thrilled to integrate the kind of tool that you're talking about. And um, that, that, you know, that would allow to, to, you know, reuse the pieces of the existing spec that we want ditched, but we don't want in there restructure because the way it's done is more as a series of patch than anything else. So this is not exactly, I agree with you. This is not the structure we want at all. And what you're proposing is much better. Um, and I think, I think this would, you know, send, send a strong message that, that, you know, we, we are building something and we're not like, you know, rebooting yet a new effort um, that, I don't know, I, yeah, that to me feels like it, it may reproduce, you know, the, the problem that were before. Well, so, yeah, the, the question I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself is like, if as a community we are struggling to get one spec done, you know, what hope do we have to get two, you know, you know what I mean? Um, and and no, totally. I would like yeah. to see one spec done. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, well, and that's why, I, that's really what I mean to say is I don't necessarily, like, I don't want to throw away effort that's already been done. I don't think that's my intent. And, and you're right that the current methodology that we've been updating the spec has been through uh, basically like patches, right? That's a great way to kind of talk about it. Um, and, but those patches very rarely give a full, like, this is the status of the accumulated specs, right? Like, that's ultimately what people want. Um, and by people, I'm talking like people who are, uh, again, writing a new scripting, like a, a custom script transaction, or if they're trying to make a new feature, or if it's even just you and me and being like, well, hang on, we want to add this new avalanche thing. Like, how does that affect our, you know, uh, P2P level or something like that? Like actually being able to go in and say, this is the state of things and uh, using that as, um, you know, a reference point, I think is going to be inherently valuable to I mean, like people like you and I, um, and I think receiving value hopefully will inspire people to do it. So I guess what I'm really saying, or to keep it maintained. So I guess what I'm really saying is the structure, the new structure is really the only thing that's going to be different here. Um, saying that this is the current status of the protocol and not incremental patches that we have to go through that aren't even like sequential sometimes. Um, I think, it, I think is, I think is the really the only difference. 
Um, so I don't know. I, I think the medium, that discussion, I would love to like talk to, with you guys all day long. That's actually something that I proposed. Uh, I, I posted in the Bitcoin Verde Telegram like chat saying, hey, is Wikimedia the right choice or is this MD tool like the right choice? I've already given like a whole like wall of text about that. If you guys want to go in and actually like voice your opinions and make uh, like basically lobby for a direction, I'm down for it. I want us to make a decision that benefits the community. And uh, I think that can only sometimes happen with conflict. Um, so let's have a real discussion and discuss the pros and cons and, and take it from there. Um, if we, if you don't think the, um, uh, the different structure is going to put us in a different position um, to, uh, you know, have this be, you know, the spec that wins or the spec to rule them all. Like, you know, I, 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 uh, I would love to get some creative thought around no, 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 that. I, I, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm in complete agreement with you with the fact that the structure needs to be changed. I think you, you are making a great call there. Um, and, and I think this is the right call. Uh, so... You don't, you don't need to defend that point specifically. Uh, I don't, I, are you familiar with, uh, so you probably know George Spolsky. He was one of the founder of Stack Overflow, if I'm not mistaken, or at least he's a, you know, a famous guy that, that wrote a lot about software in general. And he has these great pieces about the great rewrite that, that a lot of software projects get stuck into. And I'm pretty sure you know what I mean. You always, you know, like you do the stuff and it's not right because obviously you didn't know before you started doing it. So it's not right. And so people have, have in mind that we're going to do a great rewrite and the great rewrite is going to be so good. It's going to be so much better than the existing stuff. And it never, almost never happened to be the case unless the existing stuff is like in such a bad state that it's unrecoverable. Um, and, and there are plenty of reasons for that. And, and Joel is, is brilliant at, at going over those. And, and the conclusion for that, and, and I've seen that also first and at Facebook, you know, many times where, you know, we have like a multi-million lines of code, code base and, and they, you, want, you want to evolve like, you know, some deep layer of it. And there are literally hundreds of people working on it at the same time as you try to, you know, rework the foundation of it. And so, a lot of the time you're like, you know, it would be so much better that I do like some second foundation there and build on top of it, but it's not working that great. And, and you are always like contrary to construction where you would actually have to do a second foundation on this side. When it comes to software, you're always, almost always better off like tweaking the foundation little by little by keeping everything that is on top of it, you know, uh, sustained. And so, and, and so not seeing that project because it's so important and, and because I see you make the right call about the structure and stuff like that, seeing that project reset the push button makes me, um, you know, a, a, a bit worried because there is so much great stuff going on you know what's side of that and so maybe i would uh, you know you, you take it or not but i would recommend to take whatever exists and rework the structure little by little until the structure is good yeah i, I think that's a, a really good feedback and i also agree with the sentiment of like the grand rewrite you know <laughs> is I mean, the reality is software gets complicated and it accrues what people call like warts and stuff like that because stuff gets complicated. And like, even if you were to do the full rewrite, right? Like once you get into the middle of the implementation, you realize that stuff is ugly and complicated because it's ugly and complicated. Like <laughs> we did a grand rewrite of the whole full, full node, right? Like if you go into our multi-sig uh, implementation, it's a complicated mess because we have a 11 years of protocol development uh, in one function. And it, it's inherently complicated. So therefore, the code is going to be inherently complicated. I think that's going to be the true, uh, true about the spec as well. Um, and I don't, uh, I want to basically reassure you that my intent isn't to throw away all the work that has been done documenting the protocol. Um, I think it needs to, uh, 
I think we, if we stand any chance of actually even being remotely successful, we need to basically stand off the, like stand on the shoulders of that past work. Um, my, my methodology, I think, um, lends itself, I think it will lend itself well for, for this though, and not just say, say, let's take the Bitcoin cash org like spec and start there and then start making changes to it. I would rather create a backbone for it to stand on and then incrementally pull those things in. Um, and that forces someone to go through it, I think is really the benefit there. Like if you look at the, like, if you look at the Bitcoin IT wiki, right? Like if you at face value, it looks like it's pretty good. Like they have like the protocol, like uh, the actual like, protocol messages. I saw that stuff but when I started Bitcoin Verde and I was like, oh, this looks like it's going to be easy. They have all of the documentation done. It's not. <laughs> like, it really is not. It's so incomplete. Um, like, I had to literally hook up, like, uh, Netcat to figure out what the Bitcoin Cash magic number was. Like, it was a giant pain in the butt. Um, and, like, a lot of... It's just fake. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, think it, I think I ended up finding it, like, six months later after I had, you know, already decided it was easier to just reverse engineer it, but I did find By it. By the way, I, it's, it's cash in ASCII with the upper bit set on each character, if I'm not mistaken. Is it? Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. I didn't, I thought it was just chosen randomly. I, I may be wrong. I don't remember exactly, but I think this is what it is. With, so I'm going to write that. What? What's that? With what on each character? You said cash and ASCII. Yes. I was trying to figure out what it was before, but I didn't notice immediately. With what? the most significant bit set, you know, like ASCII character are ah. from 0 to 127. Yes. And so the first bit is set. So it's like in the 128 to 255 range. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I should go look at that now. It's actually, I, I'd like look to see if there was any weirdness like that. I did try to see if it was cash before, but I did not notice that it was just the highest bit was set. If you cleared the upper bit, it's cash in ask. Like, no, I'm going to look like a total moron if it's not. <laughs> but, uh, if, if memory served, this is what it is. Yeah, I gotta, I'll go check now. Yeah, see, I think having, having, a, having like a, a, an interface that makes things like, easily updatable, right? Like would be nice. So I, I think take, let's use this as kind of like a thought experiment and say, say that you were like hundred percent certain that that is actually what it is. Right. Um, that is an interesting factoid. Um, I don't necessarily know if it, like, I would like to see it in the spec just for humor, but like what would be preventing you right now from going to uh, the Bitcoin cash.org and then like writing, by the way, the magic number is, you know, Bitcoin cash with the highest bit set. You know what I mean? Like, let's look at it from like a user experience perspective. What, what is preventing you from doing that? Uh, I mean, not much, but there is always like the less friction there is and the more people are gonna, you know, want to contribute. Uh, so if there are ideas to reduce the friction there, I think they should be brought to, to Corbin and Corentin. Um, once again, I don't want to speak for them because, you know, they are not there. And <laughs> right. it's not like, you know, it's, it's not like I have the, the power to decide what they do. But uh, I really don't see why they would not want to, to do it. Like, especially if you're like, you know, if you guys agree, we can submit you a PR and you just have to merge it and, you know, this is going to be what it is, then, um, you know, I, I fully expect that they're going to, you know, be willing to take it. I yeah, I, I actually hope that they do. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry to interrupt. There's more of a, um, I don't know what I want to call it, like social element when the documentation is really good and it's like up to date to like keep it that way rather than when you just have a small amount of little bit of documentation here or there and it's incomplete and there's not a whole lot of incentive for other people to come in and say, oh, let me fix this one thing because it's like, <clears throat> you know, if, if it's 1% off and you get it to 100%, you there's there's like, you know, some kind of, psychic reward from doing that but if you go from 10 percent to 11 percent, you don't get that that psychic reward you know so i think having like a full documentation there creates an incentive around it itself yeah i think i think there is a critical mass component to documentation i think a lot of that has to do with um like 
you know, we, it's because we, we cherish the state, right? Like to your point where if there's, if we're at 99% and we like get it to the hundred percent, that feels good because we feel like we've taken something that we've already thought was valuable and make it and made it even better. Um, versus if something's at 10%, like it's valuable in concept, but it's not valuable in practice, I think is really the, the, the key point there. Um, so we're still kind of like basically paying our dues until it reaches a, a, a point where people are already appreciating this and wanting to give back to it. Um, so I think getting that critical mass is really going to be uh, essential to the longevity of the project. Um, and I think having a proper kind of like user experience is going to be the other half of that. Like, uh, so I had like to, to the question I was asking Amari or anybody really like what's preventing you from going in and making that update like right now. It's a, it's a fun fact that nobody really knew about. Right. Um, and it, you know, in theory could maybe have some value, um, or at least should be documented somewhere. Um, I think the reality is, I wouldn't even know where to look to even start that process. Um, you know, like I, I can go to uh, bitcoincash.org and, and maybe try to find where it is. But I think every time I hit a a a, uh, a barrier, I'm less li like I'm less likely to do it. So, like for instance, do I go to bitcoincash.org? I don't know. That's a decision. Maybe I go somewhere else. Maybe like uh, the NJN documentation was the place to go. Uh, and the reality is, I don't know because. Um, like I haven't received any value in I like I've received some value for those things, but it's not like it's not the place that I would want that I, that I've received the same thing in exchange. Like I have never gone to BitcoinCash.org and wanted to find a you know random detail and was successful in that. Normally, I'm actually going through the the BitMDs or something like that. Um, so that's the first barrier that we'd have to get across: is where the hell do we even go? The second one is, okay, well, I found, like, where does this go in the, you know, whole website document thing for where we specify the Bitcoin magic number, number right? Um, there's probably going to be, like, some hypotheses for where we can go, but if that's hard to find, that's another barrier for us being like, ah, screw it, I've got other things that I want to do. Um, and then, finally, the last point is going to be actually making the change. If... I have to go and like find this and then be like, okay, I want to actually make this change. And actually making the change is itself difficult because it's not on like a wiki like thing. Um, that's just going to be another opportunity for me to just basically say, screw it. This is not worth my time anymore. Um, so I think that's those kinds of focuses are going to be what's going to um, make the longevity of this project a success or not. On that note, do we have any uh, final comments on BUIP 121? I posted a few links, but that's it. Sorry, Jason, did you have a... Um, I posted a few things <clears throat> in the chat, just links that you might want to take a look at, but um, okay. that's it. Things that I, I've already written a lot of documentation for op codes and error messages in the script system that are part of the compiler for a bit off templating language. Thank you, Jason. We'll make sure those get into the show notes when the video comes out of this meeting. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, we, we're actually quite a ways into the meeting already. We've been over an hour. So um, I want to just go through the uh, next upgrade potential items. Some of these are returning from the last meeting. Um, so if we could start with the allowing more than one op return output per transaction. Anybody want to speak to that? Jumping at the bit here. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll uh, talk about that. So, um, if you're if you're doing an op return protocol like Simple Ledger protocol, um, that's great. You can make your SLP transactions; uh, they work fine. Everything's to totally cool. But then, oh, maybe I want to add a little comment on my transaction, or I want to do SLP, but also with some other op return uh, protocol together. So you'd want to put two op returns onto the same transaction. And unfortunately, that's uh, non-standard. It's, it's allowed by the consensus rules, but it's non-standard. So uh, uh, some people are wondering, um, is this limit really necessary? Could we bump it just a little bit, maybe to two or three? Um, yeah, I, I don't see any reason why not, to be, to be honest. Uh, but uh, you know, the, 
the downside is that people will be it'll be cheaper to put data on chain not significantly cheaper you know they'll still have to pay fees uh, there's still going to be overhead but yeah that's sort of the conundrum Right. If we didn't want to change the incentives there at all, um, we could also be slightly more clever about how we calculate the fee cost if, uh, based on what's in op returns. But How so? Um, <clears throat> right now, uh, by virtue of, of allowing op returns as a is standard, um, it's sort of a an effort subsidy and how difficult it is to uh to put stuff in op returns so if we make it possible to add two more you know add add multiple more op return outputs we could basically just make uh make nodes only relay it if it has a notably higher fee than it would otherwise but <laughs> i don't necessarily advocate for that i don't think it's necessary at all i don't think it really matters because the op returns yeah, are, are, are so a little different there, so, there are, uh, if we don't increase the limit, there are actually clever things that people can do. If you look at what people were doing on Bitcoin Core when they didn't increase the op return limit, okay. um, people started doing some kind of nasty things. Uh, so uh, the same situation applies here if you don't increase right. the number of op returns, I just know. So maybe let's not incentivize that also. <laughs> so yeah. what I'm wondering about this is... Um... <clears throat> This is actually a very old, you know, network problem kind of thing where, you know, like you have one internet connection here and yet you are on Zoom and you're probably, you know, on some like Telegram or some mail client and, and you know, your browser is doing a request and, you know, you have like all kind of stuff going through, through the same connection. And the way it's typically done is that you have various protocol and then there is a payload within the protocol and that payload can be whatever right the, the you know one layer of the protocol doesn't care at all what is within the payload and you encapsulate those one um you encapsulate those protocol one by one until you know you you find yourself like you know if you have one layer that needs to have several application you know in our case that would be udp or tcp and with the port number, then your operating system know what application need to receive the packet. And then the application can do whatever with that. Like this is raw bytes that is delivered to the application. And so if the application wants to encode several stream in there or, you know, do whatever with that, then, you know, it's up to the application. So what I'm wondering is, do we really want to bake all of that into the base layer, especially since the base layer is made to transport transactions. So it's really not, um, not any kind of like packet transport or stream, stream transport protocol. Rather than um, maybe create the standard for a protocol that is within the operating payload that allow you to specify, okay, this operating payload is actually two payload and there is the first one, you know, the first one is from by, you know, one to 10 and the second one is from by 10 to, you know, 100 you know, whatever the numbers. And so if you have like a standard way to do that, you can encapsulate uh, whatever you want in, in those up returns, right? And, and, and no, uh, you've not touched the base layer in any way. The base layer is completely oblivious to that. Uh, if it turns out that the way we are doing it is no good, then we can roll out a new way in the future. You can even have some application that use one way and some application that use another way. I mean, um, it seems to me like it's, it's a more flexible way to do it that way. Um, Perhaps, although it's too late for SLP. SLP is frozen, so. Yeah, excuse me? <laughs> SLP is frozen, so it's too late for SLP. That Nothing like that would be possible to like uh, back uh, um, backward into SLP because it supports no additional like if if the SLP is one uh, op return is one byte beyond what it like should be if there's any extra stuff it's invalid basically so yeah but maybe you can insert like a layer between SLP and the base layer that's what I mean perhaps for a future SLP version but the the current one is very it's very it's very strict, and the reason is um, 
I think the reason for that is basically if you don't define the rules strictly, then people are going to like not see the same uh, consensus of like what's SLP valid or not because yeah. they're going to do weird things. So it's a bit, it's very clear, very strict. Um, uh, yeah, so I would note that if somebody did want to do um, as many outputs as they want with data on them, there are ways to do that right now. But uh, wouldn't you people need did on Bitcoin. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, Correct. okay. So wouldn't you need to upgrade the software anyway if you were to enable several operator? Uh, which uh, software? Um, I think. I mean, the software that processes the operator, right? Because right now, most of that software would probably expect just one operator. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe, but uh, you shouldn't. Nobody should be writing software like that because you can at any time you can get a multi-operator. <laughs> yeah, but the SLP SLP was designed like, with that in mind. It's like it's very clear. Like, okay, obviously miners can do more than one op return. So this is what you do if you get more than one op return. Um, so hopefully all the specs are clear on that, all the op return protocols. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would just note that like multiple op returns is, is uh, extremely cheap for validation as opposed to, like, some people are posting data in serial, serial transactions. So 220 bytes, then another transaction, 220 bytes. Um, if you're if you're pasting a big blob of data that way, that's much more load on the network because more transactions to verify and more in messages. So it's way more bandwidth. Whereas an op return, oh, and also you're making UTXO entries. An op return doesn't create a UTXO entry. There's no additional inv if you're already making a transaction. Um, a few more bytes of bandwidth. That's like pretty much negligible, actually. Yeah, but, but even then, it seems to me like you'd want to have bigger up return rather than multiple up return if, if this is something that we want. Uh, maybe, but you could, you could equally well say that the, um, uh, each up, like you can define your, your network layers, let's say, where, where the packets are, you know, you can say that the transaction is um, it's a collection of packets and instead of saying that the op return is a collection of packets, let's say. So, I don't know. It, it, it sounds like it, yeah. it's, it sounds like it uh, may be a topic for a, a, a special meeting, multiple op returns. Um, just, I know, I'm noticing the time for today and I know there is some time for yeah, these yeah. potential items to get into uh, going forward. So. Um, sorry to cut you off, but I just uh, what, I also want to make sure that we cover the rest of the items on the agenda. Um, next item is the new difficulty adjustment algorithm. There's been lots of discussion on this. Uh, who would like to lead off this discussion? I can do it again. <laughs> okay, Mark, I don't mind hearing your voice. <laughs> yeah, uh, if anyone's interested in difficulty algorithms and what they do, uh, check out this guy, Zawi, Z-A-W-I. Uh, I think his name is like Scott Roberts or something. Uh, so he has been studying difficulty algorithms on all sorts of coins for like two years, kind of, and just like a, he's obsessed about it. And he's got all, the, all this documentation about different attacks that people do, uh, different defects in algorithms. Uh, it's quite fascinating. So I just want to to put that out there if you're interested in this topic check out this stuff but um, basically there's a concern with the current uh bitcoin cash difficulty algorithm that it has an oscillation problem people might have noticed that there's a um, the daily turbo mining blocks and then slow blocks in between and um because there's switch mining going on if, if there are switch miners they can't really stop the hash rates from going up and down that's just how it is, unless, unless you, you, you politely ask the miners to allocate more steady hash rates. But well, even, you know. even if there is no switch mining, it goes up and down naturally because of variance. Sure, sure. But it doesn't yeah, go I'm, up and down, but it appears like it goes up and down because of variance. Yeah, yeah. But, but right now, like, I mean, if, if your switch miners are 10 times the hash rate of your steady miners, which is, I think, roughly what we have right now, you know, the you, you know, you really notice the difference. It's much more than variance. And uh, so, yeah, you can't actually stop them from doing switch mining. 
if you're a minority coin, that's that's how it is. But the concern is that um, the difficulty swings up and down by too much. Like it, it could be a lot less. Um, so there are, from what I've seen, I've looked at it a bit. There are other difficulty algorithms. Um, there are many of them uh, that are roughly similar in behavior that increase the response if you, if you do have a market fluctuation, but they actually have a lower difficulty fluctuation under switch mining conditions. So they're better for the response in the way we want, but they also, they don't oscillate, so they don't have the big difficulty swings every day. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, <clears throat> I mean, unless those are new stuff that have been discovered over the past two years, um, two years ago, I tried a bunch of stuff and it didn't like, it, it's just, you know, wasn't, well, there was no such thing basically because um, the problem that you run into is that it's impossible. Like when you see hash rate changing fairly quickly because the, the difficulty algorithm doesn't have the price as, you know, as an input, it doesn't know the price, right? So uh, the only thing that he knows is, oh, there is way more hash suddenly or well less hash suddenly. Uh, it ended up not being very possible to distinguish between switch minor and an actual price change. Um, yeah. and, and so you end up, you end up with that trade off where you make the thing more reactive, then you adapt faster to price changes, but you also, uh, makes the things more sensible to, to switch mining and, and the other way around. And, and then you have like a third, <laughs> you have a third problem that, that is, that is a huge puffy pooper actually, because, Otherwise, it's just designing a low-pass filter, and designing a low-pass filter is a very well-known problem in, in signal processing. And there are, there are many techniques to do that that would give you different trade-offs, but the problem is like 95% of those techniques actually are not adequate because they are unable to deal with malicious input, which you typically don't get uh, when you do signal processing. It's not like someone is gonna, you know, put malicious music into your, uh, you know, your stereo uh, to try to tweak the equalizer in it, right? Uh, <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Uh, but in our case, it does work that way because we want to assume that that the system is also working under adversarial conditions, and and that you know that leads to a very nasty conundrum where every time you make one of those stuff better, you make the other one worse and, and, and you end up with your poison kind of thing. And so I was considering that recently and because the price ratio went down, you know, the margin of error that we have into that, you know, space of different trade-off that we can make uh, is becoming tighter, right? Like the more the price ratio is, is important or small, depending on which one you put on top, <laughs> um, um, the, you know, the less space you have for trade off. Like, so when you make one thing better, the, the other things get even worse, um, when the price ratio changes. And this is why we see the situation being worse now that we are at like 3% of BTC rather than when we were at 10% of BTC. And, and if we make one of those stuff better, we're going to end up making the other one worse. So I was, so I was pondering this and the main problem is there that when you actually make the decision, you don't have the information that you need, or you need to, you know, look at the information way back to have like enough data points to have enough information to make a good decision. But then you need to wait for all those data points. So you make your decision slowly. And, and so that's no good either. Um, and, and so I was thinking what we want to have is actually a steady miner. And so what if we try to deploy some kind of like proof of steady mining rather than, than tweaking the difficulty adjustment. And it turns out that I'm actually not the first person to consider that because I was pondering that idea and actually there is a, 
there is a paper, I don't remember who wrote it, but there is a paper about that very ID. So essentially in that paper, it's quite a complicated system, but in that paper, when you mine a block, you also commit to some steady hash uh, for, for some amount of time. And um, then you can unlock the Coinbase once you have provided that amount of steady hash. But the system they use is quite complicated. And I find that being actually fairly common in, in academic paper where they present like, here is the theoretically correct optimal solution, but uh, we can actually do simpler stuff that I think are, you know, they're very new, so maybe I'm completely wrong, but I think they're worth looking into. And those would be, so we don't change the difficulty adjustment, but we introduce some other way to compute like an average difficulty over a well longer period, say like, you know, two weeks or something like that. And then, you can compare when a Coinbase is spent, you can compare the difficulty of the block where the Coinbase was found to this much longer time window. What is, you know, what is the average difficulty in that, you know, much longer time window. And then you have an idea if it's like a switch mining block or not, uh, which a much better accuracy because know where you're, you're doing it when the Coinbase is being spent rather than when the Coinbase is being created where you don't have enough information to know that. And, and so you can define rule in such a way where a steady miner can spend like, you know, an easy coin base with an out coin base and the algorithm figure out that, you know, it's all pan out and, and the hash rate was steady. And so for, for a steady miner, it doesn't change anything, but you end up locking coins for switch miner for extended period of times. Um, well, that's fine. They, they don't mind, right? I guess. A uh, switch miner is just trying to optimize their their mining efficacy, but they don't necessarily care about getting paid out right away, right? I, I assume. There is a time value of money, though. Yeah, I'm sure. Not, I feel like that would. I feel like that could disincentivize the switch mining, which I think might be the point. Um, but it might also not be good. I think that's a more complicated question. I don't know. I, this is just an idea that I'm putting out there. Uh, like it's not like I ever run all the math to, to know that it's correct right. or not, but um, it's, it's a shift in mindset, right? It's like, instead of making the decision when the block is being mined, where you actually don't have the information that you need to, you make it, you know, a hundred block or, you know, after a hundred block later, where you have much better information on, on what is going on at that point where you can make a much better decision. Yeah, locking, locking the Coinbase was, that was, that was really interesting, honestly. Like, that, I think that really got my thinking for a bit. I'm not sure what, where that ends up going, but I think that's a, like, that's, that's, a, that's a tool or concept that I haven't even thought of really manipulating. Well, it, is, it is already locked for 100 blocks, and that's, by the right. time it's 100 blocks old, you, can't re you don't really want to use that block for looking at for adjusting the difficulty anyways, because um, yeah, that's already, that's already too old to react to, right? You one, say? one thing I want, I want can I just, I just wanted to comment like on what Amari was saying earlier, because I think in the last two years we have, like I think it's a lot better understood what's going on with this difficulty stuff. So I, I know there's, like I know you said there's trade-offs, but I think it's also true that there's ways that would be basically better on all fronts. Like we're not like not just you don't want it to necessarily respond quicker, but you don't want it to respond based on what happened 144 blocks ago, like suddenly. So you want like, yes. So I think there's methods that are basically simpler and work better. For me, the thing to look at is like it's a costly change to make because every wallet and and like it would affect a large part of the ecosystem. So you'd really want to like analyze what the cost is currently, like what is the uh, difference between yes. switch mining and steady mining, and then try to, and, and do like a real good analysis of all that stuff. So it only, only affects, on that um, it only affects the SPV wallets and there's not that many yeah. of them. Like if you're using Bitcoin.com wallet, I think that's using not oh, SPV, yeah. right? Yeah. Of course. So Electron Cash, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so there, there is a thing with that tail, um, so, so it's true that one of the downsides of the downside of the current algorithm is that it's quite sensible to the block that is going out of scope, and and it's a block that is one day old. And so, um, but 
it, it goes back to the trade-off that we're talking about. If if you do like a slow tail behind that, so that you know the block you know fuzz out uh, slowly and and you know don't have a large influence when it gets out of the window, then you end up being much more sensible to individual timestamps, and so you end up having much more games that you can play by putting screen timestamp into the blocks. And, and that's the trade-off that you're making here. Well, you can you can choose the window. Let's say you move to a, like an exponential moving average, I don't know, or linear weight or whatever, but you can choose the coefficient, like the coefficient weighting of recent blocks to be equal to, the, to 1 over 144, let's say. You want to make it equal to the current coefficient. And what you'll find is that if you set that, you'll have actually lower overall volatility because um, yep. Yeah, absolutely. It will, it will average over more blocks, but it will have the same responsivity to. Yeah. And, and this is what I was mentioning. This is like, if you study low pass filter, this is the kind of thing that you'd want to do because you get better low pass filter. And the trade off that you'll make is that now your algorithm is sensible to the timestamp of every single block within your window, rather than being sensible to the timestamp of two blocks. And so now, you are much more sensible to malicious inputs. And, and this, is, this is why this, this problem of malicious input is such a party pooper, uh, because- uh, are, are you referring to the, to the thing where you, you don't look at the most recent block at all? Or, or what do you mean exactly? Um, like no, the, so the let's, say, let's say, you know, like right now in, in like if you look in, in signal processing, right now you have like a square window. What we have is like a, rectangle window if you wish and we know from signal processing theory that they are much better window uh, and, and there is like a whole field of, of uh, signal processing theory that is you know dedicated to what are the different window that you can use and what are the different characteristics depending on the trade-off that that you want to make so stuff like Kalman window for instance are fairly popular and have, have better response in terms of being a low pass filter than what we are doing right now but now you end up having a different coefficient for every single block in the window, which means that every single block in the window has a timestamp that no matters. Yeah, but each one matters just a tiny little bit. So like, I don't know, I'd have to quantify what you're saying there. Like I'm not convinced that it's worth it, that it makes that it's worse. Because right no, now- I have a bunch of simulation I did a bunch of simulation uh, uh, at the time two years ago, and I, I could break, you know, almost all of those by having a portion of the hash rate Fujing's timestamp. Um, can you I, can you share your simulator? Like, because there's a lot of mining simulators out there, or share or share the attack scenario or something. Because there there are mining simulators out there, so it'd be interesting to see how that performs in a square filter versus an exponential filter. I mean, like. Yeah, so what you want here is, is manipulating timestamp. So for instance, you want to have a miner that just put timestamp that are two hours off every single time, for instance. Sure. Um, because no, all the block from that miner, you know, like they have a negative window, right? They, they are actually, uh, you know, producing negative work in effect. <laughs> and... Um, this is this is just bad. Like this is confusing those algorithms. They are not made to under that. And and well, in the ones that I've seen, like you can have a negative one, but then it just makes the following one largely positive. So then, it, like basically one block after that, it goes back to what it would have been. Yeah, there are some very good algorithms that perfectly deal with this. Actually, it's interesting. Like the the current ABC algorithm has a timestamp uh, clipping. Thing. It looks at the overall time and it clips it to a certain range. And there's some difficulty algorithms which do a much more severe version of this. And it turns out that they're malicious to timestamping attacks because um, if you're a minority chain, somebody can come in and they can mine a very particular pattern of timestamps, which allows them to get, on average, much more than one block every 10 minutes, let's say. So somebody can do turbo mining. Um, I don't think on Bitcoin Cash we're like at all at, in this regime where we're sensitive to that, but um, it's interesting. Like when if you take an elegant algorithm, then you start like introducing like cutoffs and limit limiters in there. It, it, like actually, can open up more malicious 
avenues. It might cut, shut down one, but it might. Yeah, open so it, it's another. always trade off. Like you need to do clipping because if you don't do it at all, there are also ways to to manipulate timestamp in a way that the difficulty like shoot up 10x in like a block and after that then nobody can mine on the chain anymore <laughs> um so so uh, you, that, that, that's totally dependent on the algorithm i mean if, if you choose the right algorithm it's that doesn't happen like so um there there are what i'm saying is there are algorithms that are like uh, more elegant um i mean there's there's even Ironically, there's even one algorithm where you don't even need to look at the previous block's difficulty. And it, it, it looks, I was talking about it with Zawi and it looks like it's actually the perfect difficulty algorithm, but it's, it's so counterintuitive that- uh, Oh, you look so, at the time since the Genesis block? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so- And you can, you can redefine it in terms of the uh, pre uh, previous block. So it's a relative change with an exponential, but you can also define it in terms of the time since the Genesis block or the fourth block when you- so, so there, there are a few problems with very interesting algorithm that adjust um, either adjust the difficulty of the current block based on its own timestamp or even on the timestamp of the immediately previous block uh, that have to do with selfish mining. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so you can make it based on is gonna mine its yeah. own chain, you know, on the side, mm -hmm. and it can set the timestamp in such a way that it wins the race every single time. So essentially you can selfish mine with gamma equal one uh, every single time with that familiar of difficulty adjustment algorithm. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can do this, uh, the same trick as the current algorithm where you, you do a medium of the last three blocks or something. I mean, it's, if, if you want to, you can use that instead, but um, there, yeah, so yeah, again, going back to Zawi, he's, he's found interesting things where uh, some difficulty algorithms, they did a uh, delay and it, it made it go crazy. Like it, it introduced- Yeah, I've noticed insane, that. I've noticed algorithm. that when I tried some. Some of them, when you put a delay in them, they just go completely bonker. Yeah. And that's due to like weird, like decoupling things like the every even block only depends on even block difficulties and odd blocks depend on odd block difficulties. So there's no reason why they depend on each other. So they just explode. And one becomes large and one becomes slow. So, um, but yeah, yeah I guess like, we want to wrap it up. But I think the discussion that we're just having is actually very indicative of the point that I was making. You're always trading, you know, like trading one poison for another with those kind of stuff. It's like, okay, you do clipping. Well, then you have some strategy where you can manipulate it. Well, but if you don't do it, you have other strategy where you can fuck everybody else. Um, you you depend on every single timestamp, then you can do something that are just much better. Yeah, but now you're more sensible to various manipulation. You want to adapt faster by taking the last block into account. Okay. Yeah, but, <laughs> but now you're more sensible to selfish mining. And it's just like every but, time you make something. I'm already, you're saying it doesn't, like what your argument basically means we can do any difficulty algorithm and it doesn't matter. Like it's true that there are some that are better and some that are worse. So I think it's still worth like researching and trying to figure this all out. So like, like you know what this, I mean? The square, this, the square window has a, a defect that yes. does not exist in a whole class of algorithms that are like, yes. yeah. so, they're, they're so better on that front and, and they're, they're as good or better on every other aspect. My, my point is you have a limited amount of information as input. Sure. Like, like really, this is what it boils down to. You have a limited amount of information as input. And the more information you use, the better decision you can make, but the slower you need to make that decision because you have to wait for a longer time. And, and this is what, this is what inevitably bound the stuff. So then you are, you are bound to just, you know, trade between, between different trade off um, because of the information that you have. Uh, yeah. But I mean, switching from a square window to a, a non square window, it's like, you can, you can decide to keep various invariants. Like you can keep the response to recent box the same if you want if you want to keep that the same. And then you'll see that the, the, the steady, if you were to have a steady state hash rate, you would see that the variance actually goes down because um, yes. if, you, if you wait over, yeah. Yeah, because, because of how, how the weighting factors get squared or not squared in different averages, you know, they'll- Because they'll you have a better low pass filter. You can do a, like crazy stuff like-, like uh, It's, like it's not a- filters And stuff like that, that do even better than- yeah than just doing like a window with, with various stuff. It's, um, I mean, seeing it as a low pass filter is, is one way to see it, but also 
um, as you're also describing the information problem. And so they're, they're basically like smart ways to use the information. If you're, if you're only allowed to take a certain amount of information, you can, you can weight it in a, in a good way. Or you can um, keep the same performance and then increase the amount of information the algorithm is looking at. And you, and you don't lose anything basically. So, um, so like just moving from the square, the square algorithm to an equivalent algorithm with let's say a triangle weight and, and you, you choose, you, ch you try to keep some invariant. So you choose the new window to be longer or shorter based on whatever invariant that you want to keep. Um, you'll see that like that invariant stays the same because that's how you, that's what you wanted, but the other aspects will get better and the oscillation problem will go away. So, um, like they're, they they're definitely better difficulty. They would go away when you have difference, when, when you have variation that are due to, to, um, price change. No, wait, the reverse. They will not go away when you have variation due to price change. They will go away when you have variation due to U2 variance, because you are going to filter the variance away. If you look at more information. Uh, I, well, the, the current oscillations are self-sustaining. They don't have to, they don't arise in response to um, price changes. They're just, they're yeah, they the natural. For any reason. Sorry? They can arise for any reason. They can arise due to variance and then they may. Yeah, they, they can come, they can spontaneously come out of noise. Uh, yes. The current oscillations. And the reason is that it, it has uh, that feedback due to the block moving out of the window a day yeah. ago. So. Um, so like that's that's something you can just literally like get rid of, and you don't lose anything basically. <laughs> is, what, is what I'm saying. I mean, uh, so it's not like all the algorithms are are trading off. You know the same problems. You you can actually make a significant improvement from the current one. Um, the only question is whether it's worth it, like in terms of the, you know, the the changing of. Uh, software, is wallets it, and all it, that. Is it safe to say, guys, that there'll be lots to discuss after the upgrade? Yeah. After November 15th? Yeah, of course. Yeah, after the next meeting. I just, <laughs> I'm aware of time and uh, audiences have yeah. a tendency to become a little distracted after a while. This is this has been a great discussion, though, because uh, we're getting a lot of information. So, um I want to make sure that it continues at our next meeting, and I think that'll probably be uh, shortly after the upgrade. Um, there were two other, other items on the agenda. I just want to get a feel from the room whether we want to discuss making P2P KH256 output standard. Uh, do you want to discuss that today, or can that wait till the next meeting? Same with, the, same with the 520 byte script limit. Um, yeah, yeah. With the five twenty byte script limit, I mean, some some smart contract guys were asking about that. Like, can that be raised? Um, I don't see any you reason. Probably do that in the future for both P two key hash and P two script hash. But yeah. I, don't, I don't think we need to discuss that too much. Today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I'd, I'd like to hear from the smart contract guys. Who, I guess they're not here right now, but like a little more info on what. What what's constraining them? Like how much would be good if they look forward in the future? We don't really want to turn Bitcoin Cash into like a smart contract platform, like you know, consuming massive amounts of CPU. It is it is primarily for transactions. Unlock the scripts are unlocking scripts. They're not like Ethereum smart contracts, right? They they're just unlocking scripts. So uh, yeah, but the dark part is that you want to do that are actually not very secure with the amount of security that we like anything that is multi-party is actually eh, <laughs> it's it's really playing with uh with fire like it's really at the edge of what can be considered secure so um uh, for, for people to understand a bit right now we use hash that are 160 bits for both pay to script hash and and pay to pub key hash and that is all good and fine when there is one party that generates the hash because you know you need to find a pre-image and that's you know 160 bit of, of security which is uh, actually bigger than than faking the signature so 
so this is pretty secure. Um, oh, sorry, is... I, think, I think we were talking about different things. I was talking about the 520 byte script limit. You're, you're talking about the oh. pay to public yeah. key hack to whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so suggest this has been a long meeting. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you have several parties that generate a script, so for instance, you do a multi sig with you know different people that that all the different key, which is a very common use case. No, if one of those people want to screw over the other people, they can do so by generating a hash collision rather than a hash pre-image, which is 80 bits of security instead of 160. And 80 bit of security today is considered, you know, exciting uh, cryptography, you know, exciting security. Uh, <laughs> meaning it's kind of secure, but kind of not. Um, um, at least it's expected to to be broken you know in in the coming years um and and so you you don't really want to be there um so so in the bling 256 bits hash for boss pub key uh pub key hash and, and script hash would i think be a good way to fit or proof the chain with that in mind um, I want to uh, just see if anybody has any final items that they wanted to bring forward. And we have not had any questions from the audience yet. Uh, but if there's anything further that anyone brought, wants to bring forward. forward. Uh, Jason, did you have something? Uh, Jason Dreiser? Um, <clears throat> no, I think uh, I'm interested in the, those last two items, but I think that that'll be good for the next meeting. Absolutely. Um, uh, since this is a good source video, um, Amory, do you know what the source of the uh, network magic for testnet is? Is it random or is it something you remember? Uh, I don't remember, but I know it's not random. It's like, <laughs> it's like something in ASCII as well, uh, but I, I don't know what it is. If I, the same transformation is Z5 question mark lowercase z, but I don't know, that's... Maybe. Okay, so maybe that's something else because that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's, it's cra Yeah, I'll mess with it more. But uh, <laughs> I added the yeah, explanation to one of my one of the docs that I'd been writing before. But did the mainnet uh, high bit it translate? Is. Yep, it's cached with high bit. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't know how I didn't notice that before. Um, so I have I have a question maybe. I don't know. If, I don't know if this is it. Anyway, so we um, we we have uh, an SPV wallet that we've written for the city of Dublin um, for their SLP token, um, and uh, we've had a lot of discussion about validating the SLP and what that should look like from an SPV's perspective, um, and we've tried a lot of things, including trying to go far enough back into the DAG, but. Um, that becomes difficult because requesting those transactions becomes tedious without uh, some sort of like indexing node. Um, and you just get lots of round trips. And then even then it's like, you know, anything practical is still like five levels deep and that's not really that hard to spoof. Um, so one of the other things that we've been contemplating is like basically having uh, effectively like a trusted node, um, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, but I mean, we have that opportunity because uh, Dublin is running some infrastructure and some nodes. So we can basically just set that node to be the trusted node for what's a valid SLP token um, for them. And um, that's okay. And that ultimately is um, uh, basically like resulting in us going down the path of basically writing some custom like P2P messages that only the indexing node responds to about like the validity of SLP transactions. And the route we're going down currently is basically like extending the inventory messages to, you can opt in to like SLP transaction inventory messages so that um, instead of receiving just inventory transaction hashes, you receive um, inventory transaction hashes if they're just regular transactions and then invalid SLP transaction hashes and then valid SLP transaction hashes as inventory types. And then we can also ask the nodes uh, that support this feature, um, you know, arbitrary questions if they're indexing. Um, so 
that obviously has some a lot like a lot of flaws and one of the flaws is just like the fact that our channel isn't encrypted because like any man in the middle can basically like lie um but whether or not that's good enough we you know i think it's probably getting to the realm of good enough for now but i'm really curious if there's an obviously better solution from your guys's perspective um we've spent enough brain power into it that i feel like um I don't expect there to be something obvious, but I'd be happy if there's something obvious. So maybe Mark or anybody has any input. Mark's shaking his head. Yeah, SLP is uh, you either have to verify back to Genesis or you have to ask a node who does indexing. And for the node, it's easy. It's just uh, O1 for every transaction. Yeah, the node's easy. Like Bitcoin Verde has that RPC connection or RPC call where you just ask it, and it's super easy to use. And it, it, you know, the fact that it knows its parents' validity states are really nice. Um, the one thing that we obviously explored was like the commitment hashes or like the commitments, but the commitments from like the the minter um, ends up just going to like a URL. Um, is there an intent, like, of like what the response should be? Well, I think nothing, what you want is the commitment is um, something like a, like a sparse Merkley tree or a matrix tree or some hash tree or something like that uh, so that you can do proof of presence and proof of absence. And, and so if the SPV has the, you know, a recent root from the tree, you can, you know, prove that some inputs are or are not in the tree at some point in time. And then the SPV can, you know, work back the DAG up to that point. And so if you, you know, publish um, a new, you know, a new commitment every day or something like that, then the SPV could essentially fully validate by at worst working back one day of, of uh, transaction graph, which is probably good enough, at least for the volume that we have right now, maybe, Plus, plus you can do a different commitment. Like you don't need to have like one commitment for SLP, right? You can have one commitment for each kind of SLP token. And yeah. so that ended up being uh, fairly easy to scale. Right. So I, that, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Like I was just wondering if there have anyone has actually done a commitment before so that we can try to emulate like, because like I think the spec, if I recall correctly, was basically just like, it goes somewhere and like you ask something and there wasn't anything like concrete about like what that response should look like. And I think ultimately it may not matter. Um, like maybe it's up to, you know, the uh, particular token to identify what that response should look like. Um, that doesn't feel like it scales very well, but it's okay for Dublin's case. Um, but if there's been any like progress there, I would love to uh, follow in the footsteps of so what someone else has done instead of treading path, but we're happy to do that. Well, so there were discussion, like when SLP was being created, there was discussion about that and, and various schemes were proposed. Uh, even like, I, I, I think I proposed one or two myself, uh, but in the, you know, in the spirit of getting something out of the door, uh, this was kind of like postponed to figure out later uh, the detail of that thing. And, and so it seems that, you know, um, it, it, like if it's something to, to you want to get involved, I think it, it you know, it's wanted. It's just that there was not enough uh, manpower to make it all happen at once on the one. Uh, and that part is, you know, you can do without. So, it, you know, <laughs> it went up, you know, being relegated to some annex uh, and, and maybe it's time to work on that annex and make it happen. Hey guys, we're, uh, we're closing in on two hours here, which is the longest meeting we've had this year. So um, <clears throat> I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to wrap things up uh, and thank you all for attending today. Um, and we'll get the video out with the appropriate links from uh, the information that's been provided. So I'd like to thank you all for attending and we'll look forward to seeing you after the upgrade. Bye-bye. Right.